It's worth being clear from the outset that this is not an episode that relishes its own subject matter, and it's not about hunting, whether for sport or otherwise. It's inevitable that if you travel through the Arctic or sub-Arctic on foot, sooner or later you'll have to deal with wildlife. Most is harmless and a pleasure to encounter, but I'm often asked about how my teams and I protect ourselves from animals that might do us harm, and of course, how we avoid needing to protect ourselves in the first place. This is not a one-size-fits-all. Polar bears in the summer behave differently to in the winter. Some wildlife will only be a problem if surprised or taunted. Others may actively see you as a food source, which is inconvenient. Some pose zero threat when healthy, yet become the devil when afflicted by diseases like rabies, which is when Arctic foxes, wolves and even dogs become an unpredictable threat. This will mean guns, and I'll explain which ones, where and how, in regard to licenses and so on, but also one or two ways to avoid it ever coming to that. In general, the cold regions of the world during the snowy months have low animal populations, some have migrated south and others sleep, but you'll still get some. I'll group together some of the ones that are fine unless you're stupid and hack them off. Muskox, wolverine and walrus are examples. Make lots of human noises, don't approach too close, and risk is low unless you come across a grumpy walrus and you happen to be in a very small boat. For wolves, there's no one answer. Wolves can vary hugely in size and behaviour from the subarctic forests to the tundra to the edges of the Arctic Ocean. The majority are extremely wary of humans, so if you make noise to alert them, they will keep a distance. The famous white wolves of the high Arctic are smaller and less timid, but as this mixed bag of a documentary series shows, are mostly no drama. Rabies, of course, is another matter, a tragedy on at least one side. Most people are interested in bear defence, and I'll not focus too much on northern brown bears here, as even the tundra and barren grounds bears tend to be inactive when it's properly cold. So that leaves polar bears, of course. You'll only come across them in three ways. First, if you're in or near a coastal Arctic community, which can attract bears normally happier hunting offshore. Second, if you go to the Arctic tourism circus of Svalbard, where despite the endless supply of rules, regulations and restrictions, people have still encountered and lost their lives to polar bear attack. Third, if you travel independently in remote coastal areas or on sea ice. Polar bears very rarely travel far inland, and even then it's only to traverse a valley from sea to sea, or to shelter in a den. Inexperienced backcountry guides, and yes, they do exist, will often insist on a zero-tolerance or hyper-wide berth approach in polar bear territory, born of limited yet overzealous training. But in reality you should, having read up on bear behaviour, have an escalating set of deterrents and responses, and carry a gun, because polar bears are clever enough to ambush. Bear spray does not work in this instance, nor, in the end, does a doctorate in polar bear psychology. Unsurprisingly, there's relatively little footage of close encounters, and few people have had to defend themselves against a polar bear attack, but here's something of a masterclass in calm handling of a polar bear approach. Ausland, an excellent Norwegian polar skier, basically shows the full set of escalation, save for a final lethal defence. First, get a sense of whether the bear is aggressive, curious, injured or ill, or a combination. Most bears will have a sniff from a distance and just wander off. But here, the team have to stand their ground, make lots of human noise, and then ultimately, when the bear's curiosity crosses a line, use a flare to scare it away. I'm not sure if they meant to actually hit the bear, but it has the desired effect, as it does from their tent in this other situation. Scaring any overly bold animal away may save its life in future, when it comes across other humans with darker motivations. These large flare guns are all well and good, but they are bulky and they are often treated legally as firearms, which can be a pain when it comes to storage, travel and crossing borders. I prefer these pencil launchers, which are tiny, reliable, have enough range, and you can get specific bear bangers for them, like we tested here in Canada. Oddly, they are illegal in the US, so that's a no-go for Alaskan travel. If human noises, scare bangers and flares don't help, and you have to fight for your life, and realistically here we're just talking about polar bears, a problem wolf, a rogue ox or moose, or a rabid arctic fox or sled dog, you need a firearm. And you always choose one that can deal with the largest threat you might expect to meet. There are three options. 
rifles, shotguns and handguns. And remember, we're talking about saving lives here, not sport shooting. So dubious boasts about using a 2-2 rifle to bring down a polar bear so as not to damage the fur pelt's resale value are not of interest. As long as you have the right ammunition, any rifle caliber at 0.3 or above at 7.62 in metric will do the job assuming the operator is competent. An expanding soft or wide tip and around 200 grain is better than full jacketed rounds. You want the round to enter, stop and transfer its energy, not neatly pass straight through. Bolt, lever or pump actions will be easiest to maintain in the cold, but if legal and if you're on top of your cold weather oil choice and your cleaning routine, semi-autos are not daft. Rifles tend to be heavy, but you can choose the shortest barrel possible as range isn't needed and a plastic stock. I also tend to brightly paint or wrap parts of my firearm so that, especially in the dark, a team is less likely to have an accident. Function over form. Similarly heavy, but often cheaper and easier to buy and license, shotguns. Go with 12 gauge of course, and you'll need full size or even magnum if available, rifled slug rounds. Normal cartridges with pellets will not work. This past winter, and this was from a general refamiliarization and test session my teammate and I did, here was our choice. In Alaska, you can test in most public places so long that you're a safe and legal distance from roads, buildings, and preferably people. A short barrel Mossberg pump and folding stock minimize size and weight, but it's still a bit of a lump, but lighter than a double barrel, and you don't just get two chances to hit your likely moving target. We tested with cheap buckshot first, but then on to pricier slugs, which of course kick. I went with a folding stock since I tried a pistol grip before, and as you can see, control and accuracy from the hip is hard and might bruise your hand if firing a heavy magnum slug. And this is how you destroy the inner microphone from a DJI action camera. Finally, the complicated choice, handguns. If you can legally carry one, and my viewers from the more permissive US states may be confused about why you'd not be, then it's a serious yet controversial option. Since handguns are not obviously sport or hunting weapons, and are more associated with law enforcement and the armed forces, most countries outlaw or heavily restrict them. Are they, all else being equal, a better self-defense against a predatory polar bear than a shotgun slug or large rifle round? No. But they are light and fast to bring to bear, and you can release multiple rounds in succession, which may make the difference. There are endless online forums arguing hypotheticals on the slightly weird end of the internet about whether handguns are a serious bear defense. Very few people have put this into practice, so actual evidence is scarce. Instead, YouTube people do lots and lots of this sort of thing. But if you do choose one, there's pretty much two options. A large caliber revolver, so 44 or fatter, or a super heavy 357 if you can get a heavy cast round, or, and this is where it gets questionable, a 10 mm semi-auto pistol like a Glock 20 with, again, special heavy high energy rounds. The advantages are obvious. A light polymer shell that's good in the cold, super reliable and the ability to quickly release 15 rounds. Whether even a series of heavy 10mm rounds would stop a charging polar bear before it reaches you is up for debate, but they are carried by the specialist Danish troops of the Sirius Patrol, who travel Greenland's icy north for a largely symbolic display of sovereignty. Now, legality, crossing borders and licenses can prove a pain. I don't have a license at home in England as I don't need or want one, but I do have a full Canadian license, an option open to foreigners there, and it's this full license that allows me to buy and use restricted firearms. That latter bit is somewhat moot now, as Trudeau has banned most new restricted sales, so all the stores were out of stock of handguns within hours of the announcement. In Svalbard, a high arctic archipelago and home to plenty of bears, the governor's office has exercised their favourite hobby, namely creating new rules. As of recently, borrowing or hiring a rifle there is tougher than before. That said, I found generally if you can contact the police there and explain your licensing situation and experience, an agreement can be made. Why do Scandinavia and Russia have temporary import options? Regarding the latter, home to a swathe of the planet's cold regions, obviously at the moment for most Western people this wouldn't be a wise course of action on multiple levels. In Greenland, they still have pretty permissive age and licensing requirements governing who can buy and use firearms, 
plus handguns and automatics are banned for civilians. My friend had his shotgun slugs confiscated, apparently falling foul of a new restriction some years ago, which is madness as this renders shotguns useless for bear protection in a country with thousands of them. Enforcement though is pretty patchy, although as Greenland modernises, this vast land will probably end up less and less frontier and with more rules and regs. On the Arctic Ocean, you're in international waters, so can crack on, but you'd need to comply with the rules of wherever you're entering and exiting from. Alaska is a strange one. Alaskans can buy and carry practically anything, and they do, but those from abroad are totally banned from buying, renting, or even borrowing. Constitutions and amendments don't necessarily empower non-resident aliens, but you can bring in your own firearms from abroad on a temporary import for quote-unquote sport hunting, so that's what I do. Careful though, folding stocks are considered tactical, not sporting, so you may need to explain your reasoning to border authorities. National parks, whether in Canada, the US, the Nordics, and so on, will all have their own policies. Most employ common sense. But Canada has a bizarre rule even in the wilderness. No firearms are allowed in national parks unless you have a native exemption. Even the parks teeming with polar bears. Insanity. Perhaps like the new Svalbard rules, it's to encourage, or even force, visitors to employ the services of armed local guides. But, in practice I found that the local police take a different view. Indeed, one said that he'd arrest anyone not carrying protection in a park that's home to polar bears. So, grown-up thinking can sometimes prevail. And on that happy note, I'll end. Bye.